Now, why is Q so useful? Well, here's the cool thing about Q. If you follow the value of Q over time, as a reaction goes from a non-equilibrium to an equilibrium state, you find that Q tends toward a constant. So for example, here on this slide, we're seeing the reaction of SO2 and O2 to produce SO3 and following those concentrations over time. As we've seen previously, what happens is once we reach equilibrium, which you can see here at the dotted line, the concentrations remain essentially constant. And here we're starting in two different sets of initial conditions. This is a little bit subtle to see, but notice that where we're starting is somewhat different in these two sets of reaction conditions. The one on the right starts with pure SO3. The one on the left starts with SO2 and O2 and no SO3. And in fact, we end up in very similar looking equilibrium situations. Notice that the equilibrium concentrations in both graphs look very, very similar. If we follow the value of Q, well, since we started at a different place, the values of Q initially are different in these two reactions. In fact, Q is zero in the case when we start with no product, and Q is infinite in the case when we start with no reactants. But over time, we reach a situation where eventually the value of Q becomes constant, and in fact, the value of Q is the same in both reactions. And in fact, that's true no matter what initial conditions we start with the value of Q will tend to a constant value, characteristic of the reaction itself, really, having nothing to do with the initial conditions. That value we call K, and this is what's known as the equilibrium constant. K is defined as the value of Q. You can really think of K as a number in and of itself, the value of Q for the reaction system in equilibrium. The value of Q at equilibrium is constant for a reaction at a given temperature and pressure. And it's what's known as the equilibrium constant, and it's denoted with the capital letter K. So in general, for a reaction A, A plus B, B going to C, C plus D, D, notice that we can think of K as the reaction quotient expression at equilibrium. So we can write K as molarity of C raised to the C power times the molarity of D raised to the D power divided by the molarity of A raised to the A power times the molarity of B raised to the B power. This idea of products over reactants, which we've already seen, but this is specifically at an equilibrium state. And so this bit that appears on the right hand side showing us that we're evaluating this quantity at an equilibrium state is really important to understand for the equilibrium constant. Aside from that, it's similar in spirit to the reaction quotient. It's just the value of the reaction quotient in an equilibrium state. And we can think of it in terms of concentrations or for gaseous reactions, if it makes more sense, if it's more experimentally convenient, yada, yada, yada. We can think about it in terms of pressures as well and think about the pressure-based equilibrium constant, K sub P. This observation that the value of Q approaches a constant value regardless of the initial conditions a value that's characteristic of the reaction at a specific temperature and pressure, the value K, is known as the law of mass action. And from the law of mass action, we get this kind of weird form of the reaction quotient, product concentrations divided by reactant concentrations. We get the stoichiometric coefficient as an exponent and all of that good stuff. We won't go into the origins of the law of mass action. It can actually be derived from first principles using pretty advanced physical chemistry. We're going to kind of take it as gospel and use the law of mass action to derive interesting conclusions and useful conclusions about the quantitative situation for chemical systems in equilibrium, particularly in section four of this chapter. In this practice problem, we're asked to calculate the value of Q, the reaction quotient, before any reaction occurs at a state that we'll refer to as the initial state. And then we're asked to determine the value of the equilibrium constant for the reaction. And we can do this if we know the equilibrium concentrations, plugging into the reaction quotient, the equilibrium concentrations. First things first, though, what we need to do is initially write the reaction quotient expression for this reaction that we're given here. It's this reaction of NO2 combining with itself to form N2O4, actually the reverse 
of the reaction we've been looking at in detail in this chapter. So first of all, we start with an NO2 amount of 0.1 moles added to a one liter flask, and the temperature is, is actually irrelevant. What this tells us is that the initial concentration of NO2 is equal to 0 0.1 moles per liter, right, 0 0.10 molar. And there is no N2O4 present. And we know that because N2O4 is not mentioned in the initial conditions here. So I'm going to go ahead and note that down because it's going to be important as we think about calculating the initial value of Q. In fact, let's do that right now. So what is the initial value of Q? Let's call that Q sub I, I for initial conditions. Well, we know the form or can derive the form of the reaction quotient as products over reactants using that basic idea, right? It's going to have the form N2O4, which is on the product side, divided by the NO2 concentration squared. But notice now that we determined from the problem statement that there was no product there originally, and so the initial value of Q in this case is going to be equal to zero. For reasons that we'll see in the next video, this implies that the reaction will go forward, and we can also understand that the reaction goes forward by realizing that at equilibrium we now have some NO2 left over, 0.016 molar, and we now have some N2O4 in the reaction mixture, 0.042 molar. And so we have solved A, essentially, realizing that the initial Q is equal to zero. How do we determine the equilibrium constant? Well, the equilibrium constant is the reaction quotient at equilibrium. So we could denote that, for example, as QEQ. By definition, essentially, this is equal to the value of K, and that's exactly what we want to find. So what we're going to do now is apply this exact same expression, into O4 molarity divided by NO2 molarity squared, but plug in the concentrations at equilibrium. And so let me actually just copy and paste this down, copy and paste this reaction quotient expression, because we're going to use it again, and it's the exact same thing that we just used, we'll erase that underlining, and then the last thing I'm going to do is add a teeny tiny EQ. Actually, no, let's do this. We'll add evaluated at equilibrium, which we know from the, the problem. And so from the problem statement, we can extract that the N2O4 concentration is 0.042 molar, and the NO2 concentration at equilibrium is 0.016 molar, and we're going to square that since the reaction quotient expression tells us to do so. And actually, before we calculate all this out, I'm just going to erase the molarity units since we think about the reaction quotient as unitless and we don't need to worry and really don't want to worry about the units at all. But after we do that and calculate everything out, this comes out to 1.6 times 10 to the second power or 160 thereabouts. So key here was recognizing that the value of Q in an equilibrium state must be equal to the equilibrium constant, essentially by definition. This is the magic of chemical equilibrium. And for the initial Q, we simply write the reaction quotient expression and then apply the initial conditions that are given in the problem, plugging in for each of the concentrations that appears in the reaction quotient expression. 